Welcome to Sacred Realms. Huh? It's a great day in Hyrule, y'all. Welcome to Sacred Realms, a Zelda retrospective podcast. I'm your host, Lyndon Willoughby, and I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Matt Willoughby. Matt, the specter of inclement weather hangs heavy over our recording session tonight. Well, that was that was certainly a phrase. That was that was a dramatic <laughs> phrase. All right. I, I, I felt like breaking out some, uh, um, some more melodic speech patterns early oh in yes this episode. Mm, interesting yeah. I, I verily i do say unto thee that that was quite extra how now <laughs> brown cow <laughs> unique new york unique new york oh wait now we're just warming up oh my gosh that's um a e i o u red leather yellow leather yeah <laughs> that was fun i'm glad everybody got to listen ah, to that ah. as was said in anchorman Ah, yes. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, this man, this man. devolved this devolved quickly. Into uh, absolute utter nonsense. We made it we made it from like sixteenth century playwright to Will Farrell in a in a, an astonishingly short amount of time. It really was quite fast, wasn't it? it that devolved quickly. I'm well, more impressed than anything. Yeah, I mean, yeah. well we we're known to do that and our, our tangents are legendary among the peoples. Anyway. Cool. Hi, Lyndon. How are you? Hi, I'm good. I'm hoping it doesn't start raining on us while we're doing this. It's like it feels so good outside. It's it's a little breezy, but we are supposed to get some like actually pretty bad weather later in the evening. Um, and I don't know. It's saying it's not supposed to start anytime soon, but I'm looking up at the sky and being kind of like, yeah, we're playing with fire here, but um, that's OK. You know what? We can be uh, we're, we're spry young men. We're ready for an emergency relocation of all electronic devices if need be. I think two out of three of us are neither spry nor that young anymore. But we are. That cuts me deep. Men. It hurts badly. <laughs> I wasn't ready for that level of truth and honesty on this show. We have one spry and young man and then two who are just. Kind of here, his, existing. His sprightliness, his sprightliness, and his youth are are fleeing him quickly. Though. The the sprightliness for sure fleeting as I consume more and more whiskey every week. You know, the the closer I get to being married, uh, the less spry I get. Just getting ready for my marriage bod. You got to get the dad bod. Well. Yeah, but I'm not first a dad it's yet. Husband bod. Yes, yes, exactly. First, it's you're married, and then you let loose, and then you get dad bod. Which yeah, I was gonna say, I feel like you're doing a certain amount of things out of order here, but I'm not. You know, it, it's not on me to judge you or your life. So, yeah. Um, well, anyway, getting oh, a little bit ahead of our guest intro for the week, though. Clearly, yeah, he's, he's here. Already, I mean, I guess he's already introed himself. Do we kinda, even they have just to do that now? Right? They, like, yeah, they don't even wait for us to tell this guy, here. Mike. Just you know, like haven't even introed him yet. But yeah. ooh, 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 Max and talking. Max and Josh are are normally pretty good about not doing that. Cody will interject occasionally, but you know, Jackson and the detective are <laughs> that's both because just Max like, and Josh are professionals. That's true. They are. Jackson and the detective are very much just the uh, hey. No, see, he's doing it to me right now. He's bumping me off my own mic. See, but I am family, and Mike. The detective is basically family, so we have extra privileges. So you feel like you can get away with more is what you're saying. Yeah, kind of. Okay. Hmm, I feel like we need to lay down some law there, Linda. Well, we keep bringing them back, so really this is on us. I've put up with so much in my life from you people that I... What do you mean, I, you people? Yeah, you too. The two of you. You brother and people. Yeah. <laughs> very, you two very specific yes. people. <laughs> <laughs> not not generalized group of people. And, and you know you what? Two specifically. And you know what? Let's go on this tangent real quick, right? Oh boy. One of the things that He's picking up the mic. I feel like I'm gonna have to edit out a lot of noise on mm. this, but no, sure, no, no. go ahead. No, no, no. One of the things that I might add that has been um done against me is someone has taken credit for something that was not their intellectual property. And I'm bringing light to it right now. Igor the block. Igor the Block, famously brother of Greg the Block, is my intellectual property. Famously, yes. As when we were recording our episode as a trio for that episode where Igor made his imminent entrance, I texted Matt in the middle of that episode and said, Igor, Greg's brother. And then went ahead and said it out loud, and we all got a chuckle, and it was great. 
but that has since been forgotten. Your honor, pursuant to the evidence, which has just been permitted, uh, which has just been presented in regards to the recording of said episode, I would like to make the uh, objection that all of this is still our intellectual property based on the fact that it was produced in the recording of our podcast, which we own. Yes, but specifically, (laughs) specifically, I want credit. I'm sorry. Were you given permission to approach the bench? (laughs) (laughs) I have photographic evidence of this. It's a courtroom drama now. (laughs) Your Honor, I would like to submit that as the actual um, person who said the name and has thus uh, furthered the legend of Igor the Block, and who also started the legend of the Blocks in general, being that of Greg. I uh, pertain all rights to Greg and Igor under pursuant under the umbrella of Sacred Realms of Zelda, Zelda Retrospective Podcast. I am not talking. I am not trying to take away Greg from you. All right, Greg is all on you, man. That that is you go off, man. I think um, they're intertwined, Your Honor. I'm willing to take. 60 40 split of Igor. I came up with the idea. You presented it. You get 40%, right? I feel like that's fair. Here's my deal. Here's my deal. Um, good points are being made right now. My big takeaway from this is that I feel like we have no business actually dabbling in the arena of courtroom drama because we're <laughs> really, really bad, bad at it. talking this way. Uh, we, we cannot lawyer like Picard. So I think it's best if we maybe just stop trying. Yeah, I, I'm there with that. The public now knows the truth, and it's up for them to decide, but at least the information is out there. I'm glad you feel that you are vindicated. We come here in search of good pod. Well, there it It sits. sits. (laughs) Speaking of pod, I'm about to one-up all you people by debuting my excellent pod whiskey. Oh, there you go. That's a, what what is that, a $400 bottle? It is my Joseph Magnus Magnus Cigar cigar blend. Blend. Wow. Batch 51. <laughs> well, uh, it, it, if, if it wasn't totally breaking my drinking during the week uh, rule, then I would ask to get some of that from you as I am currently smoking a cigar. Ooh. But but you see, that's part of the gloriousness of me dropping this, this wonderfulness upon you is that I get to flex it and you don't get to have it's it. It's almost like you saw this coming, like you knew this was how it was going to unfold. I felt, I felt like being the big boy right here. You know, I was about to say Jackson over here playing 3D chess, and then I thought about it, and I was like, ah, that's definitely 2D chess. It might even be checkers. Yeah, that's more like checkers because he <laughs> knew your rule was already in effect. Also, very rude. Just, just kind of rude. So there it is. I said it. Yeah, but good for you. I'm people, glad you have people it. are going to remember stuff like this when the planning of the bachelor party comes around later this year. Hey, just th- Yeet. just think about this. I thought that this occasion was special enough for me to break out one of my very very sacred bottles. Mm. So that's the light side of it. The dark side is that I get to rub it in your face, but we're brothers, so that's how that works. Oh, well, I mean, I guess that's fair. Cool. Yeah. Well, anywho, that was fun. That was a lot of how was that for how was that for preamble? That really just uh, (laughs) that really just kind of spun out into some unexpected places. I had things. You're all still here. I had things to get off my chest. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, that sounds good. Sounds like Matthew also has some things to get off his chest, namely the phlegm that he's been fighting for the last few days. Look, traveling is is fun. I like traveling a lot. It's actually one of my more favorite things. Um, Invariably, I get some like low level of ailment after returning from traveling. Um, I don't know why it's probably just like the combination of stress and a whole lot of people. Lack of sleep. Lack of, yeah. Especially this time around, lots of lack of sleep. You drank a lot. I did, uh, <laughs> did do that. That's what you do at an all expenses paid or all inclusive resort. That's Plus what you do that. there because you have to make the money worth it. And the drinks are all so weak that you have to drink many of them to get your money's worth. So it's just like a compounding thing. Anyway, all that to say, we were in Mexico for the last, uh, I think we were there for five days, uh, came back. The day we came back, we uh, left our hotel at four in the morning, uh, landed back in DFW around noon, and then uh, proceeded to be out and about, and right now we're getting attacked by a June bug. Uh gross um proceeded to be out and about until almost two in the morning because my wonderful beautiful girlfriend uh jackson's fiance and Lyndon's wife along with a few other of their female friends um all decided to go see taylor swift so us three brothers went on an escort mission to keep them safe and uh to uh to make sure that they were that was jackson's idea since he's gonna say it later anyway jackson came up with the escort mission it's a week of escort missions here I- on sacred 
sacred realm. I had this whole thing planned out, right? This dungeon is an escort mission, and we just went on an escort mission for our lady friends. It was just so fitting. That's true. And so we ferried them there and back from uh, the Taylor Swift concert, which got home all. very late. Oh, uh, yeah. So it's been little sleep, lots of travel. Um, and so, yeah, I'm a little bit under the weather, but uh, here we are. We're here well, for some And pod. on top of that, you came back to Texas in the dead middle of what we call the pollening. Yeah, where it's literally everything is coated in a fine layer of yellow dust and everybody's allergies tried their very best to murder them. But the blue bonnets are really pretty. It's true, they are. Gorgeous, quite gorgeous. gorgeous. Blue bonnets. I, I myself am, am feeling fine, but I I, I have, you, you know that feeling you get sometimes in the very back of your mind where you're just kind of like, oh, I can feel it coming. It's coming. I know I'm going to get sick. Yes. This week or next week, it's going to happen. Yes, I do, I do know exactly how you feel. No one likes that feeling. But that feeling has not uh, caught up with me tonight. What has caught up with me tonight is an opportunity to record some excellent pod with you wonderful gentlemen. We've got a new section of A Link Between Worlds to talk about this week. It's going to be a fun one. Uh, and, of course, Jackson, any excuse to uh, chat with you on this program is always a good time. We, uh, we love this continued streak of your, uh, of your involvement with the show. Third time's the charm. This season. There you go. We'll have more seasons after this. We'll see if you can uh, keep it up from here on out. We certainly hope so. It's a good time. All right. Well, I move that we should get into some housekeeping. The motion is seconded. Jackson, does the motion carry? Yeah, it carries. There we go. We did that right. Consensus. All right, y'all. If you didn't know, Sacred Realms is a weekly re-examination of The Legend of Zelda. One little slice at a time. Sacred Realms drops every Wednesday and is available on all major podcast networks. Every week we play a new section of a Zelda game. Then we sit down here to talk and to drop our hot takes. If that sounds fun to you, please head over to Apple Podcasts, hit that subscribe button, and be sure to leave us a review. Five-star reviews are greatly appreciated, and they have a chance to get a shout-out here on the show. If you want more Sacred Realms in your life, you can head over to patreon.com slash sacredrealmspod and become a patron. There you can get access to our Discord channel, Listener Mail, vote on what game we play next, and much more. Additionally, one of the benefits that Master Sword patrons and above get is that we read their names every week here on the show. Those legendary individuals are... Shepherd Street, Matthew, Chris, Daniel, Fallout 907, Kelso, Tiffany the Star, Daxel, Patrice, Stephanie, Darknuck, Brian, George, Mike, Dylan, Lenny, Melanie, Kolku, Aiden, Rowan, Josh, Nick, Dante, Gep, Brittany, Davey, Haru the Mighty, Derek, Albert, Mark, Andy, Cameron, Ben, Daniel, Nick D underscore TV, Travis, Christian, Jonathan, Hyrule Interviews, a.k.a. Max Nichols, Garrett, and Drew. These are the most legendary of individuals. We would allow them to be our escort in a dungeon escort mission any day of the week uh might even take all of them at the same time that is i don't know that i would sign up for that that's 50 no that's 25 how many people is that that's like know. that's like 30 it's almost 30 people like that is way too many that people is to be responsible people. for that is way too many people to be responsible for i definitely can't foresee a good and well-designed dungeon puzzle that would involve that many pressure switches heck i mean even mass effect 2 suicide mission couldn't handle people. yeah it was too it was already almost too many people for mass effect suicide mission and that would just be so extra yeah 41 people wow look we we dearly appreciate each and every one of you and we would do our very best to protect you all but i don't think we would succeed <laughs> some of you may, may die, die. <laughs> that is a sacrifice <laughs> that i am willing to make <laughs> unless you're garris and i don't think any of you are garris so well I don't know. That's that's kind of rude. Anyway, uh, Lord, I think that was our first Shrek reference. Well, sir, as long as none of you are uh, Ashley. Uh, poor Ashley. She's not in Mass Effect 2. It's fine. That's true. She's Well, she's there, but, but she's but, even more space racisty than normal. But then there's also Jacob, so oh, we don't God, really care about him. God, he's so boring. Anyway, doesn't matter. Hmm. Nice. Um, cool. This is just a quick reminder, too, that uh, we are we are in countdown mode, prime countdown mode right now. Uh, as of the day that you are listening to this episode, you will have one, two, three, four. <laughs> as he counts out. You will have loud. four weeks and two days until the launch of Tears of the Kingdom. He didn't even use his fingers, ladies and gentlemen. He they, did that all in his brain. That's because I was reading it off a screen. <laughs> Ma- math is hard, y'all. There was no math. I was just reading it. But yeah, I'm bad at math. Anywho, 
<laughs> Get excited, y'all. It's coming quick. But well, we're we not- should also probably put up the poll at some point soon for the game after that. Uh, how many dungeons do we have left? We have three, three dungeons, three dungeons the, final, the final, the rank, and, the re- and then the rank recap. So five episodes five left? Five episodes left. Okay. We should probably put it up soon. Uh, I'll probably do that next week. But this uh, this feels like a pretty good time to reiterate to that point uh, that we're going to go straight into another top down. Yes. After this one. Uh, yes. We're going to double up on top down seasons. And actually, I mean, we've got that four week buffer, right, where we're going to be playing Tears of the Kingdom. So yep. uh, maybe we should just uh, wait and put the poll up a little bit. You know, like once we're in that. Mm-mm. No? You want to do it sooner rather than later? You want to know what we're playing? Mm-hmm. Okay, the people cool. are going to want to know without the break, right? They don't want the suspense. Because some of them might want to play now ahead of uh, Tears of the Kingdom. Yeah. Like, well, yeah, that's, we, should, we should just that's do fair. it. And if, yeah. and if, uh, if Phantom Hourglass wins, we're going to need some time to track down those carts, so... Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, all right. That's a good point. Yeah. I'll, I'll, Josh has offered to send us some. Okay. Anyway. The, anyway. Yes. We'll have that poll up by the time uh, next episode airs. So, yeah, it's coming soon. Uh, regardless, we're not here to talk about either the next game that we're playing or Tears of the Kingdom. We are here to talk about A Link Between Worlds. Uh, we do that every week in the Sacred Realms Rundown, which is a six part analysis of what we played this week and the feelings that it made us feel. Today, we are covering A Link Between Worlds, Chapter 7. Part 1 of the Sacred Realms Rundown is the plot recap, usually read by Matt. Tonight, it is once again read by Matt. He's, uh, he's going to try and push through his ailment and give us, uh, give us a good, uh, good delivery here. So, take it away, Matt. Leaving the Chamber of the Sages, we head off to the next point on the map that Hilda has marked as containing one of our portraits. We head back to the counterpart of Kakariko Village, which in low rule is called Thieves Village. But before we head off there, we make a trip back to our Master's Forge in High Rule with our two pieces of Master Ore we have picked up in the low rule dungeons. The blacksmith had previously told us that he could temper the sword with this ore, so we have decided to take him up on the offer. As promised, the blacksmith is able to use the ore to temper the master sword and increase its effectiveness. The sword now glows with an inner red light and deals double the damage of the sword we pulled from the pedestal in the sacred grove. With this upgrade in hand to help us tackle the dangers of low rule, we head back through the nearest dimensional rift back to low rule to find the next portrait. Even though we visited Thieves' Village before, it never ceases to be a jarring experience. The utter dissimilarity of this rundown hovel of a town to our own vibrant and lively Kakariko Village is startling. The few denizens of this area walk around with faces covered by strange masks, undoubtedly meant to scare off potential small talk. As we wander about the village, we start to pick up little tidbits of rumors, some spoken aloud and some hummed under the breath of passing strangers. We even visit Low Rule's version of the Milk Bar and try to get a song from the bard there, only to be met with an odd ditty about thieving and despair. Thoroughly annoyed, we head off to find the portrait of the sage and look where the X on our map uh, that Hilda marked is. Approaching it, we find a hideous and gigantic gargoyle with a hidden door. Knocking on this door, someone answers and asks for the password in a finish the sentence as I say it kind of fashion. The doorman sings, A smart thief fears the boss's wrath. I'd rather be on a cliff. And this prompts our memory of one of the odd tunes that we heard around town. And the finishing of this line is the rhyme that goes, Walkin' a narrow path. The rest of the rhyme comes from the shopkeeper and the minstrel at the bar. A smart thief fears the boss's wrath. I'd rather be on a cliff, walkin' a narrow path. Sometimes it hurts too much to care. You think knowledge is power, but it's really despair. Every time I say I'm a leaving, this accursed life sets me right back to thieving. With the password given, the doorman lets us in and then heads out, mistakenly believing that we are there to relieve him of his duties. This gives us free reign to explore the thieves' den, and so we head off deeper into the lair to find the stolen painting. Much like the other dungeons we have explored in Low Rule, there are a myriad of traps and puzzles to solve and overcome. But some of them we are unable to solve on our own. There are many instances where multiple pressure switches must be activated simultaneously, and we are able to do so when there are gargoyles to push around, but not every room has these handy gargoyles. We are stumped, but keep heading in deeper as best we can. 
Eventually, we find our way to the very bottom level, where we find an imprisoned woman who says that she was placed in this cell by the thief leader when she learned about the valuable portrait that he was entrusted with. She asks for our help to escape, and in return will show us where the portrait is. We make liberal use of the wall-merging power of Ravio's bracelet and begin the escape back to the top of the dungeon. On the way, we are ambushed multiple times by groups of Zazak, who attack not only us, but our new ally. Their goal is to imprison us both once again, so we have to stop them before they can grab either us or her. But with our new friend's help, we can now open many of the doors that were barred by two pressure switches. This includes lowering the water level in one area to allow us to get her silver rupee, and in that same room to cause a hidden walkway to be revealed, showing the way to another piece of master ore. All in all, this den of thieves is very well stocked with booty, and we help ourselves to the lot of it. As we finally reach the top of the dungeon... Stocked with booty. <laughs> I thought you'd appreciate that. <laughs> As we finally reach the top of the dungeon once more, the door that leads outside shuts of its own accord. The only way out is through the boss's room, and the key is across the chasm next to us. With the thief girl's help, we use a moving stone shield as and our wall merge ability to snag the boss key and head into the room to face this thief leader. As soon as we enter the boss room, the small walkway leading to the large platform swings upward like a drawbridge and cuts off our friend from following us in. This proves to be rather fortuitous for her, as out of thin air, a humongous zombie-ghost hybrid creature swirls out of darkness and into life. The gigantic monster looks most in kin with Astolfos, but its red bones and lack of legs set it apart completely. Stallblind, as we learned it is called, wields a huge sword and a stone shield, much like the ones we have used elsewhere in the dungeon to solve puzzles. He takes up an aggressive stance and starts floating towards us. We raise our own sword and shield to try to maneuver around it, but to no avail. Every swing of our sword is blocked by his immense shield. Eventually, we decide to try merging into his shield like we have done throughout the dungeon, and to our pleasure, this confuses the Stallblind so much that he swings his arms wide, and we can unmerge from the shield behind him to do some damage. In shock and rage, Stallblind begins to spit some kind of darkness from his mouth, like fire, and begins pursuing us once more. The shield merge only works once more before Stallblind forsakes the shield in favor of an all-out offense. At this point, we just have to dodge his oversized blade and slash away as best we can. When enraged, he begins to spin like a top with his sword flying around him in huge arcs, and his final act of attack is to separate his head from his body entirely and to send it hunting us while spewing its dark fire. Eventually, this creature of darkness is vanquished, and the thief girl leads us out of the den. In the house nearby, she opens the door to show us the portrait of Asfala, as well as a piece of heart, and thanks us heartily before heading off to her own adventures. As soon as we collect the piece of heart and free Osvala from the painting, we are swept away to the Chamber of Sages again. Here, Osvala is finally humbled by the fact that he is not the hero he thought he was. His own power was nothing in compared to Yuga, and his arrogance has landed him far from home. He says that he would like to let us have the sand rod as thanks for saving him, but that he rented it from a rather odd fellow and he expects the rod will be returned there. With a last admonishment, like all the other sages so far, to hurry and save Zelda and Hyrule, we head back to Low Rule to continue our quest. Well done, as always, Matt. And uh, if I may say so, couldn't even tell that you were feeling under the weather during that. Really well done. Oh, I appreciate that. I do my best. You're you're a dear. Jackson. You're a dear. All right. Well, that brings us into part two of the Sacred Realms Rundown, which is our takes, where we talk about this section of the game, how it made us feel. Look, guys, I want to say that we've had kind of a struggle uh, getting more out of this section recently because our, our like the span of time we've been spending between dungeons has been pretty minimal, mostly due to the fact that um, there's just not there has not been a, a ton to talk about in the overworld of low rule. Right. Uh, the lead into Dark Palace gave us some interesting little tidbits. But other than that, it's it's been pretty. You know, it's kind of neat, I guess, but evil wilderness. You can only talk about that for so long. Um, Thieves Town uh, is is a, a little place with a lot of personality is kind of how I feel about it. Uh, and I really kind of enjoyed poking around here. A lot of fun and interesting characters. Um, some very interesting uh, differences from Thieves Town in A Link to the Past, 
Um, the personality of the thing is, is definitely very different, but, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I found this to be kind of a charming little area of the map and, and kind of enjoyed exploring around in it. I do just want to say that I did significantly less this week than I normally do in a play section. I, I basically went immediately to thieves town, poked around for a bit there and then went and did the dungeon. And that was about it. Uh, thank you, Taylor. That'd be Taylor Swift. That would be Taylor Ooh. Swift's fault. <laughs> I definitely kind of like, I, I came in uh, right under the wire on this one for the week. Um, and that's totally fine because that just means that future episodes are going to be a little beefier. Right. Um, but all, you know, um, I, I, I really did enjoy Thieves Town. I, I thought that it was a very fun place to do some exploring in. Uh, wh- how were you guys feeling about this section of the game? So I, first off, have to blame not only T-Swift herself, but uh, the detective. I got my game Sunday night, which is technically Monday morning after the concert, uh, is when I finally retrieved my 3DS. So I did all of this from getting the Master Sword to Thieves Dungeon uh just on Monday night, uh, which means I went straight into the Thieves' Dungeon, and I have not done any other of the low roll things. So. No upgrades. So you've probably got, what, like six hearts? I had five hearts because I haven't been collecting as many <laughs> heart pieces. Five hearts. You've got your basic green mail, no Master Sword upgrades. Yep. And probably not very many upgrades to your Ravio items. No. Have you bought any Ravio items yet, or are you, are you still renting. renting? Oh, wow. And I, but here's the weird thing. Before we get seriously into the dungeon, I'll, I'll just preface it with this. I didn't have any issues at all. Um, some things took a few more hits to kill, but it wasn't hard. But anyways, before we get to the dungeon, I want to talk about how I felt about getting to this, uh, which I thought Thieves Town felt very Sea of Thieves-esque, like the characters at least. Um, the the bard singing his uh, you could almost call it a sh- sea shanty, you know, like the characters I thought were really fun. It's a very musical town. Uh, exactly. Which Sea of Thieves, right? Uh, uh, it was just goofy. And <laughs> and for being such an evil place, it didn't really feel super evil. Like people weren't like menacing. They yeah. were just more like pirates. Well, the thing is, I don't know that you're necessarily supposed to get super evil vibes from this. Uh, the lore of Thieves Town in A Link to the Past was much darker than this right and and just as a reminder basically thieves town and a link to the past is where a bunch of people who tried to get into the sacred realm to steal the triforce landed after they had been turned into monsters by the power of the dark world right um which is how we get you know all the all the evil all the evil monsters that are roaming around over there um and then of course the the big boss of a link to the past's version of this dungeon which was blind the thief um who was a leader of thieves and was apparently so evil that his uh, his dark world version was just an, an immense red like Satan looking dude. Um, so, yeah, those guys definitely were not doing too well. Uh, this version of Thieves Town is definitely populated by humans, untransformed humans. Uh, they're a little quirky. There's some things going on here. But, you know, for the most part, I think what we're looking at is a group of characters who um, – are pretty understandable for, for being how they are, given that they've been living in a decrepit, like deteriorating kingdom for who knows how long. I completely agree. Matt, what do you think? <clears throat> yeah, I think, I, I think they are an, an example of what low rule has become in that way. And I think that they're, they're definitely not nearly as, as creepy or um, dangerous as a link to the past and i think that's just kind of true of most of low rule in general is it's a slightly lighter version of the dark world or dark realm or whatever and i I think that's probably for the best and fair because lore wise it makes more sense um but yeah i think i think it's fine um i mentioned a few episodes ago that um i actually opened thieves den uh kind of by accident as I was just going around collecting these little uh, rhymes and riddles. So um, it was engaging enough for me to have done that were you well, th- were you well before that you I was were, supposed to. Were you thinking you were going to get like a heart piece or something out yeah. of that? Yeah, that's yeah. exactly what I thought I was going to get. Well, I think that this entire section has kind of that vibe, right? It's uh, We'll get into the dungeon part more, but it, it's a little... 
uh, it's definitely different, right? It kind of feels almost like a mini dungeon. You don't have item, like a specific item you have to use and things like that. But even getting into the dungeon, uh, talking to the people, solving that puzzle, the, the puzzle you have to solve to get in felt more side questy than than maybe most dungeons would be and i will say that it does feel more side questy than the lead up to any of the dungeons that we've done previously to this in low rule but but let me just say i i don't mind that in fact i actually really like no not i really liked that and i liked that this dungeon was a little bit more uh mini dungeon side quest feel like i i like that they changed it up i i thought it was fun and if you're like me who was doing this in one night and just looking for a quick thing to knock out and and have some fun then then it was perfect for that it was perfect for just a little get in do some fun puzzle solving that wasn't Mm -hmm. too complicated and, and get out i thought it was great i'm curious how challenging the jump to low rule was for you because one of the things we talked about when we did that episode for for us was that we were noticing the the pretty immediate jump in enemy lethality and health yeah so having full hearts with the master sword is is really really helpful because you can do the long distance attack without using magic um but everything you know instead of taking two hits to kill it takes about three to five which honestly it, it's not it's not bad it, it's kind of like a mini hero mode if you're as under leveled as me uh and i didn't mind that i thought it, i thought it was fun um sometimes it was like all right come on this little like, just die but 90% of the time I didn't have an issue and I thought it was a good challenge. Yeah. So we have an interesting like tiered uh, level of experience going into this. So Jackson, obviously, like we've said, no upgrades, very little health. Um, I obviously have got the blue mail and a fair number of hearts, but I did not upgrade my master sword before. Oh, really? Why not? In. Because I forgot to do it. <laughs> I well, was just like, fair enough. Yeah, it was like four o'clock today and I was like, oh, time to go do a dungeon. And I was just so, like so on rails going into this that I completely forgot. Like until we got into the dungeon and I got that master ore, I had just completely forgotten that I already had two pieces and could have done that, um, which is not to say that I was necessarily missing it. But Matt, you, cl- you I mean, you very much went into this whole section beefier than either Jackson or I. Um, especially with this upgrade to your master sword, is, yeah. are, are things feeling pretty, uh, pretty lightweight in low rule now? They're feeling very high rule. Yeah. I, I, and I like that. I like that the, the upgrade to your master sword is significant enough to notice a difference. Um, one of the bloopy trails we'll kind of talk about cause I, and I mentioned it last week that I did in between last week and this week's section of game, um, was I went and did the tower of terror um, did I did the first two levels of the you, tower? Of you Terror. had to trek quite a ways out of your way to go find that. Yeah, I did. I I decided to go do some exploring for funsies. Yeah. And it is interesting because our we get our first tease for that experience in Thieves Town at their equivalent of the Milk Bar. There's someone in there who kind of uh, an NPC who uh, is talking about the the treacherous tower and kind of you know if you make it there first, that's kind of your first clue that it's a thing that you can go find. Um, but yeah, I definitely want to talk more about that in, in blue betrayals because that's, that's a thing that I really, um, I enjoy talking about. Uh, it's one of the things that I really love about this game. Um, but we'll get there when we get there. Um, I mean, did you, did you do anything of substance getting to the dungeon that you can think of other than just the, you know, learning a sea shanty basically? No, not really. Um, I explored a lot. I, I did. Um, I found the the bee guy that Mike talked about last week. I did the treacherous tower. I did some my mys, but no, I, I um, and I didn't even do the sea shanty thing. I did that like three weeks ago by accident. So really for me, I was trying to do some things knowing that I could as literally at any moment that I wanted go walk into this dungeon and, and do it. Yeah, I think, you know, because this section is titled Our Takes, and I'm trying to come up with like a take that I have for everything that's sort of going on here before the dungeon, and I think what I'm coming away with is a very similar feeling that I've had for the last few weeks that's been kind of compounding over time, which is that I'm enjoying everything that I'm doing. This is this is a very fun game, and I'm enjoying spending my time in this world. It's all moving along at such a fast clip at this point that I'm starting to I'm starting to get to a place where I'm yearning for 
a bit more things to happen here. Like I'm, I'm starting to really feel the absence of like substance um, from one dungeon to the next in this game. And it's tough because I'm trying to, th- I'm trying to think and compare it to everything that happens in a link to the past. And I know it, I know it definitely took me way longer to get from place to place in a link to the past. Uh, and it's tough because I think that might have just been because I don't have that game committed to memory and have not played it as much as I've played this game. Um, so that could be why. But Matt, you have played A Link to the Past exactly once, yep. and you are now on your first playthrough of this game. I mean, am I off base here? Do you think that that's what's covering the difference? Or or do you think that this game really is just much briefer in terms of its level of 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 things to do i don't think that it's briefer i think the advent of fast travel at the beginning of the game whereas a link to the past fast travel was not until like close to the end you spent a lot more time (laughs) just trekking back and forth in a link to the past which is something you also did a lot in link's awakening there's a lot of time spent just walking um which the natural byproduct of doing that is oh i didn't see that last time or oh i couldn't access that last time i was over here so i'm gonna go do that so i think that you have to just be much more intentional with your exploration with the advent of fast travel pretty much being able to go wherever you need to go more or less if you've been there before yeah i I would say sorry i'll let you go in a second jackson i would say that i honestly kind of feel like low rule could do with about half the fast travel points that it has I think that if it was connected completely, it, that would be fine. But the fact that it's not, <clears throat> the fact that you have to do so much back and forth, I think if it wasn't fast travelable um, as the way that it is, would become almost annoying because then you're spending twice the amount of time moving around the map as you would otherwise. I've spent exactly... A fraction of the amount of time in low real as you guys have so take my word for a grain of salt but the first thing that i noticed was the ability to wander is a little bit easier because in a link to the past everything is almost a single gradient color and it kind of gets a little bit difficult to see like exactly where some paths might be and, and things like that. Whereas in this game, the color palette has multiple distinct colors hmm. on low rule. So you can kind of get a better grasp, almost like high rule, where everything's very set apart. Um, it's been a while since I've played Link to the Past. Please take my word with a grain of salt. That was just something that I immediately Link noticed. Link to the Past definitely has a lot more kind of like sneaky entrances to places. And like the 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 more flat quality of the 16-bit art style and the lack of the depth that we've been mentioning that this game has, it, it definitely creates a difference in experience. I don't want to say whether one is necessarily preferable to the other. I think that this is definitely easier, right? Um, <clears throat> it... it, it it creates less um, points of friction for the player. And I think most people, especially um, especially people who find uh, stuff like the way that A Link to the Past does it to be frustrating, probably appreciate that. Um, I kind of appreciate both styles. And if I had to pick one, I'd probably say I actually sort of miss, uh, I, I, I sort of miss the way A Link to the Past does it. Um, where you have to be a little bit more on the lookout and be paying a bit more attention to the small little variations in texture, you know, where it's like, oh, there's like a hidden path into the trees here or something, you know? Mm -hmm. I think for me, it comes down to I'd like a happy medium. I'd like low rule to be more connected so I can more freely travel it without having to fast travel. And by doing so, remove many of the fast travel um, options that are there so that I am incentivized and prompted to do more exploring because I don't feel like I have to do much exploring unless I'm doing it for the sake of content, yeah. like for our podcast. Yeah, sure. I just want to retract a little bit of what I said in my previous statement. Having looked at images of Low Rule and A Link to the Past, there's more green. You mean the Dark World. In, in A Link in, to the Past, it's just the Dark World. Right, right, right. Well, in A Link to the Past, there's more green than I remember. For some reason, I, rem- I remember it being extremely tan. And I don't know why I remember that. But for some reason, I have a memory of it being very 
tan light colored gradients. I don't know. Um, so, you know, anyway, it is what it is. Yeah. Um, but my first entrance in, into low rule, right. I, I, starting playing this on Monday, I had to still beat, um, uh, the Hyrule castle section to get access to low rule. Um, and, and so I've had very little time in, in, in this specific overworld. But, um, yeah, now I, I, I think it's, I think it's interesting. I like that it's laid out almost in a reverse style. Everything seems to be switched, right? Even your little save points rotate the different way and, and things like that, which, yeah. which I like. I, I like that added detail. I love the little bat rooster weather vanes in Low Rule. Yeah, yeah. I, I think they're cute. I, 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 love them. I, I like the little changes, and I, and I think mm-hmm. it adds something. So mm-hmm. I, I enjoy it. Well, there you go. I think that that uh, brings us to a pretty natural concluding spot for part two what do y'all say we get into part three which is the dungeon map where we talk about this week's dungeon from mechanics to music and more this week's dungeon is of course the thieves den and uh yeah i've you know i'm i'm looking forward to talking about this one i think that in a lot of ways it's a very stark contrast to last week's dungeon which was skull woods um and it does in my opinion it does some things quite a bit better than that dungeon did. Um, but I'm going to throw it to you first, Matt. Why don't you give us some upfront thoughts about Thieves' Den? So I I liked Thieves' Den quite a lot. Um, I think that it was a very focused dungeon that really knew what its mechanic was, knew what it was trying to accomplish, knew what it wanted you to do, and set out in a positive way to do to accomplish those things. Um, we Everybody knows, if you've listened to this podcast, uh, everybody hates escort missions. Like, everybody in the whole wide world hates escort missions, and so do I. We we ended up coming into a pretty positive place with the medley one last yeah, season. Yeah, that was though, the only we? one that we've ever liked. Yeah. Ever. And it's also because we got to interact with medley, and she was actually like, important and purposeful to the puzzle solving um so the fact that this was an escort mission like as soon as i figured that out when i got down to the very bottom about halfway through the dungeon and you then have to escort this person i like the hair stood up on the back of my neck but i was starting to get like i'm not gonna like this dungeon nah. and i got kind of you know in my head about it um but i decided to take a breath and like experience the dungeon for what it was you know regardless of that and came away with they did it brief enough that it and and like it was it was not high stakes enough i I think they did it okay like it's not as good as medley but it was just brief enough that it wasn't a huge pain the mechanics weren't overly complicated and annoying to make it difficult and just like overall it was fine for an escort mission combine the fineness of the escort mission with a what I thought was a well executed dungeon overall um, I came away really really liking it I, I liked the uh, wall merging the multiple pressure plates the the puzzles that were in here were fun to solve um, m- moving around the room in a certain um, cadence and direction the triggering the hidden walkway to get the master ore was fun uh, draining the pool to get the hundred rupees um, and the, uh, the, the one I really liked was, um, using the gargoyles to push the right pressure plate so that you could, uh, merge across the wall to the other side to pull a switch and then changing the configuration of the, um, wall panels so that you can mm. do the same thing. I yeah. thought that was a very well executed, cleverly designed puzzle. One thing I want to say before I bounce it to Jackson is, uh, to your point about the rupees, I love that as is appropriate to the theme of this dungeon being a thieves hideout, Mm -hmm. man, this dungeon just drowns you in rupees. Mm -hmm. Like you get very rich going through this one. Plenty of booty. I went from 780 rupees to like 1400 or something. Yeah. There's, there's a lot, there's a lot in here. Jackson, how did you enjoy this dungeon? I thought it was fantastic. Um, and not for the reasons that Zelda dungeons usually are. Which is interesting, right? I liked this because it was it was a lot of fun to just go through. You didn't have to think about everything super hard. Um, there was some backtracking, but not in a but not in an annoying way. Um, I I thought it was fun um, in some of the rooms, like when you were escorting uh, the thief girl. thief girl. 
when you were escorting her and then you would get ambushed by some thieves. Uh, I thought that those battles tended to be fun because uh, there was a little bit of anxiety if they were going to get to her or not. So you kind of had to fight off multiple at a time. Uh, and there's specifically one room where it has the plates that or the belts that move multiple ways. Yeah. And you can use the master sword projectile to knock them on and then it hits they get they get onto the belts and then they fly off the map yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i also really liked the trap door one the trap door floor you you can get them all on the trap doors go pop and boom they're all dead yeah Yeah. that's great that's always a good time yeah i I mean i thought it was i thought it was fun because it was it was a little bit different it was um there there wasn't a specific uh item for this dungeon and i actually liked that so and here's something that i want to talk to you about specifically jackson because we were talking last week with skull woods and just a little background here there are two dungeons in low rule that you do not need a ravio item to beat it's skull woods and then this one and we were talking last week about how even though this game does not have a set order in which you need to do the dungeons it still feels a little bit like Maybe they were intending for those two dungeons to be the first ones that people do when they get to low rule. I think there's an even better case to be made for this one just because it's right there. It's right there. And like you, you start your journey in low rule in this section, right? Um, and so I think there's an even better case to be made for that here. Um, and, and I have a few other reasons for thinking that. Actually, just kind of one big one that I'll get to when we talk about the boss. But um, yeah, I, I think that what this is ends up being is a dungeon that even though it doesn't have uh, an item that is required for puzzle solving uh i still found it to be i still found it to be a really good time because of exactly what you guys are talking about which is that it has it has a focus um it has a very good identity to it like it it kind of sells that fantasy of 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 raiding a thieves hideout very well and it carries that through the entire thing um and it just it feels like a much more confidently made dungeon and a much more focused experience than skull woods did last week would you say that that is kind of how you felt about it too matt absolutely yeah 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 um and, and so it's so fun too because you know let's talk about the escort mission of it all um well before before you get into that i just want to mention you said that it almost seems like this and Skull Woods were meant to be played first. Uh, well, I used a guide, I believe it was a Zelda universe, that that says to go to Thieves Hideout first. It's probably ZeldaDungeon.net. ZeldaDungeon.net. Right. Right. That's what it is. And it tells you to go to this one first, which was great for me because I looked it up to make sure I was going to the right place since I was going to go straight there. Mm-hmm. And it was the first one listed and it was like, go immediately there. And it, it worked out great. I'd be willing to bet that that's just as much because you get the sand rod unlocked by beating this dungeon. And so once you have that, you're much more free and open to just literally like once you have the sand rod, the desert palace becomes available to you. Um, and previous to this, it was not. So I can kind of see a rationale for that you know, in, in that whole point, which is that, um, you know, once you have this one out of the way, you can just, you can, you can do them all after this. And so I'd be willing to bet that's maybe the reason that they decided to do it first. Um, but it, it just works out, right? Because what this does is one, if you, if you get to low rule as you are Jackson with not too many hearts and no upgrades, um, this one is not super challenging from a combat and survivability standpoint right? It's basically all puzzles and learning what to do within a given room. But fun and not frustrating puzzles. Right. Which I really enjoyed. Sometimes in Zelda dungeons, there are puzzles that are frustrating because they're not exactly obvious how you solve them. Um, And there's something to be said for not being too easy, which I didn't think that this was... (coughs) I didn't think that this was too easy. Um... But I thought this was just easy enough to where, as I said, if you've got 45 minutes to an hour to just play some Zelda, this is tons of fun. You go in, you don't have to think really hard and and nothing is, there's not a lot of backtracking to go find a certain key item you need to go all the way back to solve one puzzle to open one door. Yeah. I, which I thought was great. Did you, and actually there's only one key in this dungeon, right? 
There's a small key to open the the door to get her. And then the boss key, which you get right before you open the boss door. Right. So here's a question I have. How long did it take you, Jackson, to realize that you had to merge into the wall behind the walkways and then pop them down? Not that long. Yeah. I mean, as soon as I saw it leaning up against the wall, that's pretty much the first thing I did, Uh, which is weird because traditionally I'm really horrible about remembering to merge which is the whole stupid point of the game. And I, for some reason, can never remember to do it. We've been hearing that a lot. I, I don't know why. I don't know why I can't remember. But I but every time I'm like stuck somewhere, I remember, oh, I can merge here. And I don't know why I never do it. I, it's just, it's more frustrating for me because it feels like it should be really obvious to use the main mechanic of the <laughs> dang game. But, yeah. I get you. I think it... I think it really goes back to the fact that TIE Fighter. So let's talk about the the escort. Are you okay? Yeah, that was my back. Oh. Uh, You love those, though. Yeah. So let's talk about the escort quality of this dungeon. Um, I think because it's kind of, it's it's linked inextricably to solving most of the puzzles that are in here. Uh-huh. And I do really like the way that it's done. I think if you're going to do an escort mission in a top-down dungeon, then this is basically the best way to do it, right? It's not too super complicated. It's mostly just making sure you've got her on a switch and you on another switch. But it's done pretty well, and it kind of really helps um, – it kind of helps give this dungeon sort of that necessary backtracking quality – that we've been missing from some of them, right? Like one of the things we keep coming back to in this game is that it feels like the dungeons don't have that multi-layered arrangement that we that you get from other Zelda games where you get a key item and then the dungeon opens up, right? Right. And so one of the one of the nice things that happens here is that you do get that not by getting an item, but by, by f- getting a person. By getting a person, yeah, by getting somebody to take care of. And uh, and, and I she's think that- and she's not annoying, right? Yeah. She's not right. naggy. I mean, if you try to leave her in a room, she'll be like, "Hey, where are you going?" Which is totally understandable, right? Like that's pretty scary. Like your one protector is abandoning you. Yeah. That's scary. Definitely way less annoying than the, um, the escort that you pick up in the, a link to the past version of this dungeon. Right. Which ends up being the boss, you know? (laughs) Yeah. I remember that, but that was such a confusing thing because this person you're carrying around is just like outside, want to go outside or I forget what she says exactly, but it's something super like, it makes you think you need to take this person back to the entrance of the dungeon. And so I think all of us, when we played it, went through and just like left the dungeon and yep, nothing totally happened. did that. And then you had to go all the way back down and then go get her again from the dungeon. Yeah. So yeah, that was a pain. Well, I totally thought that she was going to turn into the boss, especially when the door closed. Well, so did I, I got it. I got it kind of mixed up in my head because in a link to the past, that's what happens. Turns out the person you're escorting is the boss. So, um, I was kind of like when, when you first free thief girl, I was think I was thinking like, Oh, much more personable than I was remembering. <laughs> I think this is the boss, but maybe it's actually not. <laughs> and then by the time we got to the end, I was like, oh, yeah, that was a link to the past. OK, got some wires crossed there. But uh, but I do think that the the escort based puzzles are fun. Um, and I do like that there's a little bit of element of risk whenever there's a room with enemies. Right. Because if you let those enemies get too close to her, then they grab her and take her back to the cell. So, yeah, and I thought that was great, especially for me being lower leveled, low hearts. Right. If I lose half a heart or one heart, then I can't use my greatest weapon, which is the master sword with its ranged attack. And that's what was so crucial for me to keep them away from her. Right. I can battle one, turn around and use the ranged attack to push them back from her and then go to them and battle them and just keep them away until they're all dead. And the bow and arrow is pretty handy for this as well. It is. But I I really didn't need it. you can do this entire dungeon only using the master sword as long as you have full hearts because you can trigger all of the little orbs that change yeah. things from far away mm-hmm. using that. And, and I will say like that. that I also had full hearts for most of this dungeon um, just because there's really not too much that's actually threatening to injure you here. Yeah, there's not a lot of damaging things. So um, the other thing I wanted to say about this is it's in the running for best escort mission for one simple reason. She follows you through the doors 
without <laughs> having to be carried. <laughs> it's a big deal. <laughs> if you remember, that was my one thing with Medley last season was I hated that uh, so much. We're so. seeing some big advances to escort mission technology here. Uh, yes, thank God. Um, also, I wanted to say just kind of a general comment. She has pink hair, which I find interesting as a parallel to the pink bunny and the pink haired link of A Link to the Past. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, th- I thought that was a pretty interesting little... Um, I'm assuming it was a purposeful little Easter egg. Well, thing. Somebody had to have pink hair, right? Yeah, yeah. I thought it was great. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So I, I will say though, to the to the point about combat difficulty, I would have been okay if there was just a little bit more from an enemy standpoint in here. Like I, you know, if you, if your if your goal is to make a dungeon that doesn't have too much of that, which you know Zelda does. F- Fairly frequently, I feel like especially in top-down Zelda games, um, you can really break dungeons down between has a lot of enemies or has a lot of puzzles, right? This had perhaps the easiest mini-boss that I've encountered. Well, it's not even a mini-boss, just a room full of dudes. Well, but here's the thing. It tries to make you feel like it's hard because it's dark. Oh, yeah. Right? That's what you're talking about. I was like, yeah. talk about the trapdoor room? No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it so. tries to trick you into thinking it's going to be hard because it's all dark. And all you can see is its eyes. But as long as you just get into a corner and constantly slash the sword, then it doesn't matter because you're going to hit their eyes and eventually they'll keep coming back at you and eventually they'll die. And it, it might take 30 seconds, but it's <laughs> it's going to be over it's really quick. Easy, easy and safe. But so, uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. That's one example of a room that I think could have been just a little bit more difficult. You know, uh, maybe if if there was even just one chamber where like your escort gets like blocked behind, I don't know, a wall or some chains or something and you have to clear a bunch of enemies to unlock it again. I think that that could have been a good time. Um, this is a very minor nitpick just because, again, I do think that this dungeon comes together into a, a very fun product. Um, my main criticism, which it, it has now, I think, turned into a criticism uh, of this dungeon uh, or of dungeons in this game, does remain true, which is that, if anything, it just could have been longer. Yeah. Yeah. As you said with it, <laughs> Nice. As you said, like as a general rule of even just the overworld exploration, everything about this game, I'm sitting there saying that felt like an appetizer and half of a main course. Give me the other half of the main course. I don't even need dessert. Just give me the other half of the entree. Yeah. And I don't know if this is a top down thing, but it seems like top downs are about 75 percent as long as uh, 3D dungeons just as like a general rule i'm not sure if that's meant to be purposeful because it's meant to be played on a handheld most of the time these days specifically yeah so and in older games when they were console right it was harder to design games well i think that the difference is that with top down dungeons just because you have the one plane of a visual going on you know uh, all you're really having to do is look for how do I get in and how do I get out, right? In 3D dungeons, you spend a lot more time observing the space, you know, just because like it's in like in a, in a 3D Zelda dungeon, it's a lot easier to be hiding entrances and exits or things within rooms or whatnot, you know. And um, I think it's it's just a difference of of perspective there. I will say that in a lot of top down Zelda dungeons. Uh, they end up feeling like similarly beefy experiences because the top downs just have more rooms, right? They're just bigger. They're more sprawling. And I think I'm really starting to feel the absence of that in A Link Between Worlds dungeons. You know, in the high rule ones, it was fine because that's early game, you know? Mm -hmm. And in some of the low rule ones, it's still fine because, you know, there will be interesting mechanics like the darkness in dark palace or there will be a lot of enemies and so you spend a decent amount of your time in combat um and yeah it's just i just like i love what we have here i love it it's great i just want more you know i just want more i'm still having fun ascending the levels right something that's consistent in this game is that you're going up right uh you're ascending rather than just progressing linearly uh and i i like that i like that you're going up but uh i am finding that it's not as lengthy as you're saying right like i feel like i'm ascending levels extremely quickly um which 
like it's one thing to ascend like six levels in a few minutes time but i would rather ascend three levels and have it be meaningful that i ascended them like feel like you really accomplished something when you get to go up yeah you know yeah no i i definitely get that um do we have anything else that we want to say about the puzzles or anything that happens in this dungeon before we get to the boss? I do feel like we need to mention that. Um, so the main item that you can find in this dungeon is another piece of master ore. That's great. Always love getting those. We now have three, which is awesome. Um, out of four, four right? Yeah, yeah. Out of four. Uh, this, I only have one. Okay. This, this one is, well. yeah, <laughs> this one is pretty much impossible to miss. Right. Whereas the, the dark palace one was you know, very, <laughs> uh, a lot to talk about there. Um, and then skull woods was a little bit easier to get a hold of swamp palace, just a little bit easier. This one is basically like, you would have to go out of your way to not go get it. essentially. Yeah. yeah you'd have to totally skip the pressure switch puzzle, which is right in front of your face, which I don't know any person who plays Zelda regularly that skips an obvious puzzle. Right. Like yeah. even if you don't know what it's going to give you, like it may just be 50 rupees, but yeah. it's like a, it's like an itch you have to scratch and you're chasing that, that, that uh, <laughs> puzzle dragon. And you're like, I gotta, gotta, gotta solve that puzzle. <laughs> gotta solve it right now. Gotta, yeah. gotta step on all the switches and gotta collect all the hearts, even if you're at full. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Which as someone who only had five hearts in this dungeon, the fact that, like 50% of every skull you came across gave you a heart was fantastic because it allowed me to keep using the ranged attack on the Master Sword. So Yeah, absolutely. Thank goodness. All right, well, let's go ahead and talk about the boss. The boss for this dungeon is Stallblind, and continuing a theme that we have had in low rule dungeons, uh, this boss I found to be very fun. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely not not a short boss either, you know, definitely. I think he's probably, other than Helmus or Gemisaur King, the longest boss we fought. Yeah, um, and it's split up into multiple phases, right, which is nice and helps things to kind of, you know, it helps it to feel kind of spaced out and like a longer experience. I want to say from a lore standpoint what I think is so interesting. So the name of this boss is Stallblind, and when you look at this boss and then you also look at Blind from A Link to the Past, it looks like they're the same critter. This yep. is just the Stalthos version of it. Yeah, it's just the, the undead version. And so the question I have is, did we kick blinds ass so hard that we punted its remains into another dimensional plane and it landed here that would be absolutely hilarious and i love the thought of that yes <clears throat> i'm gonna go with yes because because that's the, fun yeah it's fun and also uh i can't think of many other bosses that detach their craniums and throw them at you right so yeah i mean it's got it's got some similarities there for sure absolutely uh, but I will say that, so the second phase of this boss obviously is a little bit more hectic just because you're having to do damage to the body while the head is floating around and spitting like hot oil at you or whatever that is. Mm -hmm. I did find the first phase to be a little bit more fun just because I really, 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 really love the mechanic where you have to merge into his shield in order to do damage to him. I thought that that was like a really clever thing. Um I think it's just such a fun way of interacting with the model of the boss, right? Um, it's uh, just a, a neat little, a neat little way to capitalize on the main mechanic of this game. I loved, I loved this boss. I thought it was tons of fun. The only complaint I have is I felt like in the first section where you have to do the uh, merge into the shield mechanic, which I also thought was great. the The one thing I found was it seemed like. The amount of time you spend waiting on his ghost form to finally go away while you avoid him just seems slightly too long, right? Uh, not overly long, but it, towards the end of that amount of time where you're running away from him, it just, you're seeming like, man, like, am I, am I missing? At first, you feel like you're missing a mechanic, right? Like, is there something I need to do to turn him back solid? Like... Um, and then finally he just reverts back and like, oh, okay, good. But it, it seemed like a weirdly long time. But, uh, but other than that, I didn't really have any complaints. I thought it was tons of fun. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. The one thing that I was going to say earlier, talking again about the difficulty of this dungeon and one of the reasons that I think it might be intended to be the first one that you play is the amount of damage that stall blind does to you when he lands a hit. Just tell you to take a picture of Gatsby. <laughs> He's gone now. Yeah. He heard me say that. So like when you actually get hit, even even on hero mode, when you get a, a hit on his giant ass sword, 
it really does not do that much damage to you. It's only half a heart in regular mode without blue mail. And so like with even so even with blue mail on hero mode, it was only doing two hearts of damage to me. Oh, then it's probably a whole heart with and, blue mail. And so look, <laughs> I don't want this boss to be too punishing from a damage standpoint, but I never felt particularly threatened by his attacks. Like after I get, after I got hit that first time, it kind of immediately took away a sense of like, oh, I really need to avoid this attack. Otherwise I'm going to be done quickly. Um, and you know, it like it was still it was still fun. It was still fun to be doing, so it didn't take away too much for me. But yeah, I really do wish that there was just a little bit more of a sense of danger here. At least a sense of danger that felt like it was consistent with how terrifying he looks and how huge that sword is. So I'm gonna admit something embarrassing that might be better for blooper trails, but it's important to talk about here. Uh, I went into this boss the first time with three hearts, uh, two and a half, uh, just because I had some bad luck with enemies swiping me while I was protecting Thief Girl in the last part. Um, and the three skulls that sit outside uh, didn't give me any hearts. Yep. So I just had to say, screw it. Uh, ran in uh, and then tried using the bow, which worked for a time, except for the bow doesn't do quite enough damage to really progress you very much. And he ended up just nicking me just enough times where I died, which was a, a pain, but it wasn't the end of the end of the deal. So went and got Thief Girl back and um, went in with full hearts the next time and, and had no issues. So yeah. in, an interesting thing I found was uh, I died and I didn't even bother to go back and rent any of my weapons back, right? Or items. So I went only with the master sword and that's it and i did that whole th section of game with just the master sword and five hearts so mm -hmm. it kind of shows you the difficulty level of that dungeon right that i did everything with five hearts and the master sword with his ranged attack and had no problems yeah yeah definitely definitely could have uh, seen a bit of a kick in difficulty from the boss just from a damage standpoint um, do either of you have anything else you want to say about stall blind before we kind of move on from this cool boss? I wish he has, I wish he had stuck to the fire attack a little bit longer, a little bit more. I never even got hit by it. So or, I don't know what it does or that it had like more range, range or, or yeah. because this is a pretty big arena. And one thing this boss it's fight, huge. yeah. One thing this boss fight doesn't have that previous ones have is a feeling of like claustrophobia with the boss, you know? Um, Even though you can fall off it, it doesn't really feel like you have small space to work with. You're not really right. afraid of falling off. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So we beat Stall Blind. Well, so I did have one other thing. I really liked the character design. I liked his model. Yeah. I thought he was a really cool looking boss. Yeah, he's massive. Yeah, he's really cool. Well, I... He's massive, but I, I think his design is really interesting. I love when he separates his head and that flies around. Like he, he's just the sword he carries looks really cool. I, I really liked how he looked visually. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So we beat Stall Blind. We make it back outside. Thief Girl unlocks the house next to the thieves hideout for us. This is where the painting of Osfala is chilling. And I want to be completely honest. I had it so ingrained like to just walk up and touch the painting that I blew right past the piece of heart. Ah! <laughs> and, I mean, you can go back and get it. So it's not, oh. a, it's not a huge deal, but like I, I went forward and pushed a, and then saw the piece of heart sitting there and was just like, Oh, uh, 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 oh my bad. Okay. So something I thought about when I was playing this was, I think it's really interesting that, Osfala is the first person in this game you see get turned into a painting. And then from my perspective, and as ZeldaDungeon.net explains, for you to go to this dungeon first, he's also the first one you get out of a painting. And I don't know if there's any significance to that, but I, I think it's interesting that he's the first one you rescue. And... How is this guy a sage? I was going to say, I thought the thing that stood out to me was that it was just super unfortunate that we couldn't leave Osfala in that painting forever. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd like to just abandon him there. He sucks. <laughs> <laughs> he might be the most underskilled sage in Zelda history. I mean, this guy is 
so overconfident and just exudes douchiness and <laughs> and there's nothing of substance there and now we have to rescue him and he serves on this like council of sages that's supposed to like mentor us to be like oh yes go defeat evil i'm like i don't give a crap what you say how did you enjoy your first trip to the chamber of the sages jackson having him be the only one there was really disappointing <laughs> <laughs> like it's this really cool looking space and in my memory of of that room is mostly from ocarina of time where it's full of these wonderful characters who inspire you with such confidence because they are so awesome to behold and you're like oh it's almost like being in a council of uh the white lotus from avatar right like that level of wisdom and knowledge and 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 then it's just him now it's just a swallow it's just a swallow oh so disappointing sorry just a swallow we're never gonna love you no no all right well i think that that wraps up part three let's go ahead and get into part four which is bloopy trails where we talk about interesting things that diverted our attention this week and Matt, I'm actually going to kick it to you here first because uh, you know you've you've already kind of teased us with having some thoughts about the Tower of Treachery or the Treacherous Tower or whatever it's called. I just called it the Tower of Terror. Okay, there you go. Because <laughs> I like I like that. Reminds me of the Universal Studios Park. Right. Um, yeah. So I, I went and did some exploration and found the uh, Tower of Terror, and I did the first two uh, challenges for it. Um, and it was a lot of fun. It's uh, for those of you who don't know, it's up in uh, the Death Mountain region, which in Low Rule is all snowy instead of all lava. E. It's where the Tower of Hera is in the uh, in High Rule. Correct. And um, it's just like a it's an enemy mob arena. So you pay like a hundred rupees or two hundred rupees and go in and just fight a whole bunch of enemies. And at the end, if you defeat everybody. Then all the uh, moblins that are in the stands throw rupees at you. And so you get like double back what you put in, basically, if you survive. Yeah. Um, but it can kill you. So, you know, don't die. Um, it's a lot of fun. I don't know. Um, I did. the. Uh, I found the first round was not hard fighting. Uh, I was a little bit annoyed fighting Moldorm again at the end of it. The second round is longer and it's more just mob enemies. Like you have just a lot more enemy density. And I think the last room is like 20 or so shield bearing moblins that you have to figure out how to get around their shields with. And that was, that was hard. I actually died doing that one time. Um, and then went back and did it again and beat it the second time. But, um, I think I used mostly the big hammer to stun everybody in the room, get behind them and then throw some fire rod and hit them with my sword. So yeah, yeah. Um, that's a good strategy um, or just dropped bombs and ran around for a while. I did that a couple times too. It worked pretty well. So that was kind of my main bloopy trail. Uh, I did a couple, uh, some more my mys and I did some more. Um, mm, did I talk last week about doing the rupee rush in low rule? Yes. And I didn't have the sand rod. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that, that was kind of my main events for, uh, for bloopy trails. That tower is one of my favorite things in this game. I usually don't go up there until I'm closer to done and I have a lot of upgraded combat items and some more hearts. Yeah. Um, so I'll get up there sometime soon, but, uh, I will say that once you get to the most difficult level of it, it's very long and it really does kind of challenge you in some very interesting and fun ways. The, uh, so this tower is the way that you actually, I can't remember if you get both the upgraded lantern and bug net from this or just one or the other. I, I don't recall. Um, but there are upgraded versions of both the bug net and the lantern. And one or both of them you get from doing this and from beating it. Um, I, I just think that this thing is a lot of fun. And it really does. It showcases how fun the combat can be in this game in a really great way. Uh, especially once you... Uh, once you get into the harder levels of it and you've got to start thinking about like, you know, what is the best item to be using for this, you know, um, depending on the number of enemies, is it best to stun them all with the, with the tornado rod? Is it best to just chuck a fire tornado down the arena? You yeah. know, like what's the, what's the best way to do this? Um, and I think that's really, really great. I think that not 
any of the dungeons really ever give you an experience where you're having to rotate through items like that in order to overcome the combat, Um, especially because the dungeons mostly all center around one item. So the enemies that you'll find in them are pretty much just uh, dedicated to being beaten with whatever item you go in with, you know? Um, and I, I just, I really love that this is just a bigger space that allows you to kind of freewheel with your combat style. Um, definitely a very fun take on the kind of trial of the sword style of, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I, t- I, t- I stole Jackson's point. <laughs> I was about to say, it's a precursor to trial of the sword and breath of the wild, right? Yeah. Yep. Which I think is, is really cool. It's really interesting. Yeah. I would love to see the next top down Zelda have a trial of the sword esque thing now that they've kind of perfected it in Breath of the Wild, right? They kind of know how it should work. And, and I think that's a really fun, interesting concept. Yeah. And I, you know, I think Breath of the Wild will always, it, that's always going to be kind of its own beast just because you've got the environmental awareness and, and kind of, everything that goes along with that in breath of the wild. So it's definitely not apples to apples, but it is the easiest possible comparison. So, um, that's definitely why we kind of come back to it. But, um, yeah. So I, what I would say is that if you're hurting for rupees and you're comfortable with combat, definitely go do the tower of treachery because that's a really great way. Definitely probably the best way to do some rupee farming in this game. Um, certainly better than the stupid baseball game and um, probably better than the rupee rush as well. It's uh, definitely a bit more of a time commitment than the rupee rush. So if that's a factor for you, then yeah. But But enjoyment, you know. Oh yeah. Yeah. Definitely a great time. So this is kind of good for blooper trail, bloopy trails, but uh, maybe something to look forward to is how interesting a trial of the sword might look in tears of the kingdom. Now that we have all this forging, we'll we'll see, won't we? I mean, (laughs) Super fun to look forward to. No, absolutely. And one thing that is interesting about that, I know this <laughs> this is Tears of the Kingdom talk, but Breath of the Wild, I think we actually had an announcement at this point before Breath of the Wild came out that there was going to be a DLC system to it. Um, and that's obviously how we got access to Trial of the Sword. I don't think they've announced that they're doing anything like that with Tears of the Kingdom. I, uh, I don't know. I, you know, we'll see. I have a hard time believing that they won't be doing DLC for that because it's such a huge game for them. And it, I think it worked out really well for Breath of the Wild, but that's neither here nor there. Um, Jackson, what were your bloopy trail experiences this week? I, the only thing I can kind of include is the fact that I did all of those things to get to this part of the game, right? Once I got into low rule, I went straight in because I was cut for time and I didn't want to adventure too much because i wasn't sure how long this would take so uh had i known that i could have knocked this out in an hour i might have done more stuff i found one uh my my kind of on accident but i like stumbled upon it i was like oh well i'll grab that my my and and i did but that was pretty much it i wish i had more to say yeah uh my bloopy trail for this week was that i did pick up and drop off at a taylor swift concert (laughs) (laughs) so there you go same i did that too that's where all my time went yeah i'll definitely have uh, more to say about this next week let's go ahead and move on to part five which is z targeting where we lock on to fascinating characters or enemies that we happen to cross i have one that i'm really excited about but Mm -hmm. i i'm gonna go ahead and pass it off i want no 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 i want to be last you want to be last i want to be last i have a good one all right. Um, Matt, I'm going to let you go first. Um, I'm going to go with Stallblind. I think he he's a very interesting um, enemy. He's I like your theory about him being kicked into another dimension after being uh, blind to the thief and after being whopped so hard by us. Yeah, um, I think he's one of the most unique bosses I've ever seen in Zelda from a character design standpoint, especially in a top down game. So uh, big props to Stallblind. Very nice. So mine is going to be one that for the life of me, I did not remember this character being in this game. And I just stumbled across this person while I was exploring Thieves Town. And man, maybe one of like the most personality, uh, you know, laden characters that we've kind of come across, especially for someone who doesn't like, as far as I know, actually do anything like there's no quest or anything that you get from this NPC. They're just there purely for set dressing in Thieves Town. It's the weird monster shaman who hangs out. What? 
No, you're good. You're good. You're good. Uh, I was just itching. Yeah. I thought you were about to blurt. It's the weird monster shaman who's hanging out in Thieves Town. And if you go, if you go talk to this person, uh, so he's over hanging out where the old man is in Hyrule, and he's on like a soapbox, like an actual soapbox, basically. He's up on a pedestal, and he's literally like. He's literally this weird preacher that has formed a cult of monsters in low rule. And it's just so freaking funny. Like if you go listen to the dialogue, he's literally just like, hear me, brothers. We have fallen victim to our own corruption. The only way forward is to embrace the path of the monster. And like he's basically formed a cult around the evil critters that infest low rule. And that's so freaking funny to me and also kind of dark, right? Because in a world that is this like depraved and has like fallen from grace this hard, of course it makes sense that the inhabitants who are left alive would, would like fall in line with all kinds of crazy stuff like this. Right. You know, look anywhere to find hope that you can. For some people, they went to the weird monster shaman. And I just thought that was freaking hilarious. Like, uh, like the Batarian mad prophet on Omega and mass effect Two. repent. The end is nigh. I mean, (laughs) yeah, definitely big end is nigh like doomsday cult vibes here. I, I mean, that so interesting you say that the guy's character name is literally Batarian Doomsayer and he <laughs> literally stands on a soapbox literally on a soapbox which is hilarious so my Z targeting might break a rule um, but trust me it's worth it I'm intrigued my Z targeting is Princess Ruto from Ocarina of Time for being the absolute worst escort mission and the worst person you could ever be engaged to ever especially after playing this game because the escort mission in this is fantastic the thieves girl is great and is totally someone who i'd rather be engaged to than princess ruto who is just absolutely such a nag is not appreciative of your help at all this girl is like you know, all about it, like wanting your help, you know, saying, oh, please don't leave me in this room. And you go help her. And Princess Ruto is just over here being like, Link, you're just doing such a terrible job. Why aren't you helping me more? I feel like you're just, I feel like all you're doing is creating a roundabout Z-targeting pick for Thief Girl. Yeah, but it was more interesting the way I said it. (laughs) I think you might have broken the rule just a little too hard. No. Transdimensional, uh... Z targeting. The Z targeting, I guess you could say, is Thief Girl because she's so much better than Princess Ruto. I like that better. Okay. It sticks to the rules of the game. It sticks to the rules of the game a little better. I like that. But suck it, Princess Ruto. You suck. I Man. Think we can all agree with that. Did you uh do you feel better now? Have you been sitting on that for a while? Yeah, yeah. I I felt pretty proud of that Z targeting. Okay, cool. Thief Girl for having pink hair and for being way better than Princess Ruto. <laughs> I like yeah. it. I like it, Jackson. Well done. <laughs> so we took it we took a ride to get there but uh but yeah was nice all right let's get into part six which is our final thoughts in which we let matt break down this section of the game in as succinct a way as he can think to do so this section of game continues the trend of a uh, short exploration and short to do outside of the dungeon. Uh, we continue our trek through low rule and come up to thieves village, which is the uh, dark counterpart to Kakariko village and dive into uh, a really well designed dungeon that uh, knows what it wants to do and sets out to accomplish it in a meaningful and uh, focused way uh, with a perfectly fine escort mission that doesn't chafe anyone too bad um culminating in a very um interesting but not difficult boss fight uh that really gives us one of the most well-designed characters that we've seen for a while um and an interesting headcanon about his origins um freeing us is the culmination of our journey here even though we really wish that it wasn't and we could just leave him in that painting where he belongs but nonetheless he's out and now we have to go get the sand rod I do just want to say, I think it's funny that freaking Ravia wouldn't even let us hang on to that sand rod until we fall in battle, right? Right. Like, yeah, like we didn't fall in battle. He fell in battle. Sends, Come on. Im- sends his little bird pal immediately to grab this thing from us. Thanks for nothing, Ravio. Mm-hmm. I thought that was so freaking funny, though, when Osfal is in the Chamber of Sages and, and he's, he's like, like, yeah, I rented this sand rod from this weird dude. It's like, and the whole deal was that if I fell in battle, uh, well, never mind. You know, it's like, <laughs> oh, you 
you fell in battle. Uh, you lost. So the you know what I just realized that we didn't mention in I didn't mention in um, plot recap or just now in the um, off the cuff recap is that uh, Princess Hilda has another interlude here. Oh yeah, that's yeah, absolutely. It's, true. it's very brief, and that's why I didn't really mention it. Was she just? It's she's still talking to Zelda's painting and just saying like, "I I hope Link has the strength to be the hero we need." And I'm still getting creepy, sinister villain vibes from her, and I don't know why. And I'm just waiting for her to betray me and stab me in the back. Yeah, this one definitely made it sound like she's got a lot riding on us, mm-hmm. right? I mean, it definitely it definitely seems that Link is the very end of hope for Hilda, right. you know? Um, and so look, I, I'm very excited for the veil to be lifted on the backstory of low rule. I, I actually feel like that doesn't happen until the very end of the game. So that'll be fun to talk about when we get there, but we definitely get some more hints here, right? I mean, Hilda mentions that low rule had legends and it had all the things that we know from high rule. Um, and you know, she's definitely kind of lamenting the loss of that. And so it's a fun little interlude. I do think that this is a neat way to, given that we don't spend much time with Hilda, mm-hmm. it's a neat way to continue cluing us into her character um, without us actually having to meet her in the game. I, I think yeah. it's a good use of a, of a thing there. So yeah, no, I, I think it's very well done storytelling mechanic. Yep. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of the Sacred Realms Rundown. We will, of course, be back next week with another installment of the Sacred Realms Rundown talking about another dungeon, another section of the game. Before we get out of here, I got a question for you, Jackson. Is this game still kind of grabbing you in a fun way? Like, are you still, you know, are you still enjoying your time with it? Would you say that it's uh, something that you're enjoying more than other top down Zelda games that you've played? Less? Jury's still out? Yeah, I, I do like this game. I, I do think it's fun. Um, it's not grabbing me as much as uh, Link's Awakening did. Um, and I don't think that's anything to fault this game. Um, I think that the merge mechanic is fun if I remember to do it. Uh, but I think that the story and the surroundings of Link's Awakening are a little bit more grabbing. And the art style that they did with the update is fantastic of Link's Awakening. Um, although, I must say, I... I love the new look of this. I mean, if you did a Links to the Past with a new skin on it, I think this is a great way to view that almost um, with an added uh, mechanic. And I, I think that's great. Uh, so I, I really do enjoy this. I, it might, it's not my favorite top-down Zelda game. It's not my favorite Zelda game, but it's by no means a bad game or or even at the bottom of my list of Zelda games. I think it's I think it's fun. All right. Love to hear it. Guys, this has been a really fun chat. Jackson, it's been really fun having you back again. Uh, we are not going to be able to catch up with you again before the end of A Link Between Worlds, but uh, of course we will have you on the podcast again at some later time. Did you beat Breath of the Wild? Yeah, of course I did. Okay. Are you going to be playing Tears of the Kingdom from launch day? Well, I mean, depends on what plans I have on my birthday, the day it comes out. But uh, yeah, I'm definitely (laughs) sure I'll be playing it at some point if I'm not too inebriated to play it on the 12th. (laughs) Happy birthday to you. Here's Tears of the Kingdom. There you go. I feel like that's a pretty freaking great birthday present. Between that and the Coheed show we're going to that week, it's going to be a pretty great week. Certainly better than my 21st birthday, which happened during the height of COVID. Oof. Yeah, took a big L on that one. The world took a big L on that one. (laughs) Um, But cool. Well, you know what? Um, We'll catch up with you as you play through Tears of the Kingdom, and uh, maybe we'll get you on for a discussion about about how your thoughts and opinions are unfolding with that game as we're all discovering it. (laughs) in real time for the first time y'all the wind is really starting to kick up out here i feel like the weather is uh coming pretty quick it would probably behoove us to close this one out and call it an episode since we do not own a wind waker or an ocarina of time to control the weather that is probably the right move there you go all right y'all if you enjoyed today's show and you'd like a little extra sacred realms in your life, you can head over to patreon.com slash sacred realms pod and become a patron. If you've got no rupees, it's not a problem. Five star Apple podcast reviews are a great free way to support us. More reviews means that more people see our show. That makes us very happy. Hi, Leans. Man, you okay? I got the hiccups all of a sudden. <laughs>
<laughs> Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Sacred Realms Pod for updates on the podcast and for behind the scenes action. Sacred Realms will be back next Wednesday with our thoughts on A Link Between Worlds Chapter 8. We'd love for you to play along with us and to share your thoughts on our social channels. A Link Between Worlds can be played on the Nintendo 2DS and 3DS family of systems. But in the meantime, may your hearts be full, may your arrows never miss. We'll catch y'all next time. Sacred Realms is an independent podcast production, which is produced, edited, and mixed by me, Lyndon Willoughby. Our music comes from Zelda and Chill by Mikkel and is graciously provided to us by Mikkel and Game Chops Records. Zelda and Chill is available to stream on Spotify or to purchase directly from GameChops.com. Finally, our thanks go to Nintendo for creating such exceptional and innovative experiences. <laughs>